Our next speaker is a mushroom cultivator and also a martial arts expert and instructor. He owns his own institute where they teach half a dozen different types of martial arts. He's expert in all of them and you may not know this, but they're all African-based martial arts. Okay, so it's not just like Japan and China that have martial arts. Lots of cultures have martial arts, and he's proficient in a bunch of these ones uh, from the continent of Africa. And interestingly, I was chatting with him, and he was talking about how all cultures' martial arts come out of their entheogenic use, out of their use of psychedelics. So, you know, we typically talk about psychedelics as being like about peace and love and uniting the world and being one and things like this, but actually it also produces fighting styles. Okay, so it's not all peace and love. You know, there's some fighting too. And so these things are interrelated in an interesting way that I think is underappreciated by our community, and so I wanted to come and talk to you about some of these things. Okay, for him, some things are supposed to be tough, and psychedelics is one of them. So he's going to be talking to us about that and challenge us a little bit, I hope. Um, he will start with a little biography to tell you how he got into all of this. Okay? But, um, but he's also got uh, lots of different messages, including that high doses, very high doses, are the way to go. Please help me welcome Kalindi Iyi. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, get my clicker out. All right, good afternoon. Oh, yay. Uh, my name is Kalindi E. I'm from uh, not far, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, as Brian was saying, I'm a cultivator and a traditional African martial artist. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got into this space and things like that. I've been uh, ingesting high-dose mushrooms since 1973. And, you know, I have a little bit of experience that started inside of the space and have been for the last few years uh, doing talks around the world on high-dose mushrooms and how they are included inside of the psychedelic realms in space. Um, starting out, it was 1958. And I was in the back of my father's car with my brother, and we were like down in the seat. And I looked up over the, the top of the seat at the drive-in, and this is what I saw. Yeah. This is from the seventh voyage of Sinbad. Great movie, my favorite movie. But it set me on the path to knowledge, the weird, having to think about something more than in just our regular three-dimensional five-sense reality. So what I'm going to be talking about is some of the ancient utilizations of mushrooms, of which I consider the quintessential hallucinogen of this earth. Mushrooms are the oldest. They have the greatest plenum of knowledge and information. They're 465 million years older than any plant on Earth. So when we talk about them, we talk about where they came from and how they got here. They are believed to be extraterrestrial, but also interdimensional, hyperdimensional, extradimensional. And they come from far, far away and a long, long time ago. So. Extraterrestrial spores percolating through space. The spores are some of the hardest things in nature, and they can, in the vacuum of space, be virtually immortal. And when they find a space or place where they can liberate their knowledge because they're a organic technology, in other words, they were created as a mnemonic device, in other words, a device of memory, Helena Petrova Levatsky called it the Akashic Records, but we call it the Records of the Acacia because it's the DMT compendium of knowledge and understanding that has given us the breach out of the proto-human into the human. And that happened uh, 
on the continent of Africa. We have the oldest records of hallucinogenic mushroom use in South Africa and also in the Sahara in Algeria, a place called the Tessili Plateau at Egeir. And in that place, you have labyrinth caves where it depicts the earliest spiritual people and how they became the earliest spiritual people because it came out of the fungi of which they ingested when grasslands were first produced on earth following the cattle for food because you know men it was a division of labor basically men hunted and women gathered although of course if you're walking by and see a potato you're going to pick it up so it don't, I'm a man I'm not going to get the potato no <laughs> but what happened was was that men weren't really that great of you know they weren't great hunters they would steal meat from when a predator attacked an animal in between the scavengers getting their piece, they would run in and get some. They still do that in Kenya today with the Maasai. They will go in and either drive the lions off or they will go in when the vultures and other uh, things are coming and drive them off and grab a piece of meat. So the beginnings of this thing, we believe, as far as fungi, on this planet is a uh, either asteroidal impact or a meteor impact that dispersed the spores into the earth, just like panspermia. You know, the sperm comes into the egg, fertilizes it, and then you get baby mushrooms in 2019. <laughs> the last great climactic impact was what they call meltwater pulse 1b that was 11,600 years ago before that meltwater pulse 1a was 12,800 years ago and this is what basically disrupted the climate and it basically disrupted disrupted the actual living conditions of North America where we are now. After the last ice age, the Pleistocene, you had on top of Pittsburgh a two mile high ice sheet called the Laurentide Ice Sheet. And when four meteors or comets came over the top of Canada and hit right in the thumb where Detroit is, about 50 miles from Detroit, was an impact that carved out Lake Erie and knocked chunks of ice moving at 12,000 miles an hour all the way down to North Carolina, which created what was called the Carolina Bays. It sent freshwater tsunamis 1,000 feet high, taller than the tallest building in Pittsburgh, moving across the United States. Now, it's a long story to this. This isn't a Younger Dryas lecture, but you have what's called impact proxies that validate at 11,600 years ago that this happened. It left exotic metals, palladium, iridium, nanodiamonds, microspherials, miniature buckyballs. All of these things show at a particular time that this happened. And why am I talking about this? Because it changed the climate in all these different places and basically the world. But Africa, Northern Africa, wasn't as affected. So in the Sahara, of which we were talking about, where we have the oldest records of hallucinogenic mushroom use, this changing of the environment created migrations and where these migrations happen, people moved from the north into West Africa. They moved uh, to the Nile Valley because when we talk about ancient mushrooms, we have to talk about ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt was a psychedelic culture. Man's bodies 
with birds' heads, women's bodies with cows' heads. Now, was this just the rearranging of consciousness inside of a trip that they said, oh, let's make a man's uh, body with a fish's head on it without any precursor of knowledge. Just let's make it. When they said, you know, they were walking around naked as the day is long. You know what? I'm tired of sleeping out here under the stars next to a fire. Let's build a pyramid. <laughs> there were no pyramids around for them to look at to say, okay, well, let's make one of those. What they did was pre-dynastic comedic priesthoods in their sojourns on mushrooms and also DMT from the tree of life because the acacia nilotica, the acacia of the Nile, was the tree of life. This is what Osiris and Isis were born from, fully formed. The knowledge of these things were hallucinogenic, psychedelic, entheogenic. They drew what they saw. They went to the place. When they came back, they produced a society that they saw in hyperspace. They saw pyramids and Tekken and Ben Ben stones. And they said, hey, you know what? We can do this when we get back to regular three dimensional five sense reality but we gotta build it out of stone. We can't build it out of light like they did in the hyperdimensional realms. We gotta build it out of stone. That's why the civilization is supposedly just come out of nowhere. There's no precursors to that because they were walking around in Sahara, no shoes, you know, because it's a hot place. No shoes, no clothes, none of that. But then you see them in the Tessali Plateau drawing pictures of people with belts on, pants, boots with laces in them, and helmets and Batman utility belts. So where did they get this from? Were they walking around and saw a guy in a spaceship, a spacesuit? Or did they see those spacesuits in the hyperdimensional realms of which they were sojourning? Now we're gonna get into this. In North America, when that impact happened, it killed most of the megafauna in, the, in, the, in North America. North America had four different types of elephants. These are some of the things, or some of the animals, of which were killed out during that impact. You had the flat-nosed bear, which was the most horrific predator on North America, killed them out. You had the dire wolf, if you were familiar with Game of Thrones, the large wolves of which um, Jon Snow had and the rest of the family. Those were small in comparison to the actual dire wolves that was on the North American continent. You had the giant beaver. <laughs> These were the size of beavers in relationship to a human being that were roaming around the North American continent. So delving back into this hyperdimensional, extra-dimensional realm of sojourn during actual trips that were in ancient times, Frank Drake said that there are gazillions of different types of high civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy alone. But also in the Vedas, they talk about that there are 400, 432,000 different humanoid types just in this galaxy alone. But then you always have somebody that throws a wrench in the punch bowl, and that was Enrico Fermi. He said, well, if all these different entities are all over the galaxy, why aren't they here? Why aren't they flying through? Why don't we see them? Because super civilizations, miniar they, they, they miniaturize. So instead of talking about SETI, which is Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, we talk about SEPI which is a search for infraparticle intelligence. So what my talk is gonna be about is how they brought from the virtual realms in the quantum areas, knowledge back into the regular dynamic of which we live. Quantum 
fluctuations, particle entanglement, all of the things that we're getting into now because we are re-emerging technologically into the realms that the ancients had and had already phantomed thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago because meltwater pulse 1b was the, air, was the impact that sunk Atlantis. Now I know people will say, well, that was just a story of, of Plato and the Tamius and the Critias and you know, he was basically making these things up. But his ancestor Solon told it to Critias the Elder who told it to Critias the Younger who told it to Socrates who told it to Plato. And that same Younger Dry's impact information goes exactly with the sinking time of Atlantis because it raised the water table 400 feet worldwide because it threw chunks of ice, fresh water, into the Atlantic. It also changed the North Atlantic Current, which is the prime position of what happened that changed the climate worldwide. You threw fresh water into the seawater, in the Gulf and also in the Atlantic. Meaning that that fresh water changed the, the salination of the ocean. So when solar radiation hits the equator, it accumulates heat. And as the North Atlantic Current brings it northward, it liberates that heat over time. But when the water became less salty, that heat was liberated before it came north and threw the world into another ice age. This is the reason why you don't have the records of mushroom use in North America in ancient times because all those records were destroyed when this impact happened. So let's get into the story. Downscaling provides the answer to where are these extraterrestrials at. They have descended into the quantum realm during simulations. Mushrooms validate subjectively the quantum realms. That's why we need more physicists and string theorists doing high doses of mushrooms. Because they're the ones that give us the theories of what reality is. There's a professor, uh, he was at the University of Maryland, uh, Professor Sylvester James Gates, who was the first graduate from MIT in supersymmetry. As a matter of fact, supersymmetry was so new that Professor Gates had to teach his teachers what supersymmetry was so that they could give him his PhD in supersymmetry. But according to his supersymmetry calculations, in the basis of our reality, the same algorithms that run Google, Facebook, and the rest of them are embedded in the reality. So it's, it is a self-fulfilling technology. They've taken what is the mycelial network which is the internet of the earth, mycelium, fungi, mushrooms. And that knowledge, because the mushroom mycelium is sentient, what we see as the mushroom is the reproductive portion of the mushroom, the, skin, the stem and the cap, the cap being female and the stem being male. Them together makes little mushrooms. And so what he said, what he says is, is that according to the calculations, we're utilizing the same algorithms that reality utilizes and that we're in a simulation. But simulations are better than simulations and better than simulations. And when you go into these realms under the influence of the mushroom, the psilocybin mushroom, because psilocybin mushroom, regardless of what they say in London and other places, is DMT. Psilocin is DMT. It is the ingestible form of DMT. It's, it's not an alchemy. That's why we know it's the oldest. It's older than plants. It's older than cacti. It's older than ayahuasca. The last five mushrooms gave them the formula on how to produce ayahuasca. Hey, we got these five mushrooms left. What are we going to do? 
we're in the jungle. We're not producing them like we're on grasslands or in the woods or something like that. We're in the jungle. What are we going to do? Well, let's give it to the most experienced. Let's give it to the old guy. <laughs> old guy took it, shared it with the old lady. And what they did was went into those trip realms and they came back with the formula for ayahuasca because they went into the forest or into the jungle and anybody who's taken a high dose of mushrooms, or ayahuasca, when you go into the jungle and those things start lighting up, the trees start talking, the tree is over here one moment, you think, dang, that's a nice tree, look like it got a face in it. Then all of a sudden, you turn around and look back and the tree's over here. <laughs> what it did was it pulled out of the fauna and flora of the jungle and illuminated the vine and the leaf, and you put those together, but psilocybin, the mushroom, doesn't have an alchemy to it. Ayahuasca, you have a person in between you and ingesting what you're ingesting. It's not like canary grass. Canary grass is another, another thing we'll be talking about when we get down a little further. But these are the different areas of the quantum realm, going down from the nanometer and nanotechnology, which our phones are created out of, you, the miracle of nanotechnology, what they're having different conferences on now is femtotechnology, 10 to the negative 15th or Fermi, which is where the magic starts. That's where they're talking about replicators. So when people arrogantly say, oh, well, in 2050, we, you know, we're going to have a food crisis. In 2050, you will say, as John Luc Picard says on the, on the, in his room on Starship Enterprise, he will say, Earl Grey tea. And out of nothing, out of the virtual realms, the replicator will produce a cup. It will produce the saucer that the cup sits on. It will create water or organized water. It will heat the water to the perfect temperature and produce the formula of Earl Grey tea at the proper temperature for him to drink. And you'll be able to say the same thing. Burger and fries. Boop! From your replicator. So these are the different areas inside of the quantum world where gluons and quarks and all the other subatomic particles exist, but then there is the Planck length, 10 to the negative 35, which is where they say it is, you can't go any lower, you can't get any smaller. That's the end of it. That's the beginning. When you pair your consciousness with the DMT containing tryptamine hallucinogens of which mushrooms are the quintessential psychedelic of the earth. It gets down below the plank length. It goes into where the super servers are that generate the macro reality of which we are in existence. Now, everything being one is only a neighborhood. They have standalone systems that have absolutely nothing to do with this universe and those in this universe. This is a clip from Ant-Man going subatomic. Now this is you. You have to imagine not looking at this, but being this and moving through the different subatomic realms under the influence of a high dose of psilocybin. The, dis the, the difficulty is with trying to convey this information is that most people who have taken psilocybin, most people who have taken the others have not taken enough to have a sufficient dose, to have a sufficient experience to be able to phantom this type of information. Now this isn't the trip. This is on the way to the trip. You haven't hit rock bottom yet. You're flowing through different areas and magnitudes of the very, very small. This is how, this is the microverse. This is the way that we go down into the smallest of the small. You go so far down and get so small, you come out the other end big. 
and you in the you in the macro universe. These are some of the mushrooms in West Africa. This one particularly, the tam the tame mushroom, is the mushroom of knowledge. Alonka is the mushroom of the universe. These are used by the Duna Fang, by the Fang people. These are, this talks about it, talking about iboga paired with mushrooms, because iboga was paired with mushrooms. Iboga was used by the mandrels. When the male mandrels would be ready to fight one another over a female, they would take the iboga root and eat it and eat it, and once they got to the proper informational structure that they needed to be able to spar and fight with one another. Now, it wasn't to the death, but they fought until they found out who was the superior because that was part of passing on the genes to the female so that you have a forward escape through the children that each generation becomes stronger and better. Now, these are the Fang people. National Geographic that Af did Africa a disservice. For 100 years, for 125 years, for 150 years, they would take photographs like this. And they would say, this is what the Africans are, this is what they do. So, you know, you're going to cook dinner, this is how you dress up. <laughs> you're going to get water from the well, this is how you drink, this is how you dress up. And they said, this is Africa for 150 years. So people, oh, Africa, the dark continent, they have no knowledge. They walk around in crazy suits. But when I was presenting last month at Breaking Convention, Breaking Convention is the largest psychedelic conference in Europe, or in the UK, Europe, I showed this picture after this picture. And I said, what if National Geographic had said these wild people, you see the red faces? Because they're eating people. They have these whips of which they beat you before they put you in the pot and before they ate you. This is a festival, just like with the Duna Fung, it's a festival. So these wild people were from London. So the Londoners really didn't have a, a great time with that. But what if National Geographic had did that for 100 years, said these were the wild Londoners? You wouldn't want to go see Big Ben and the, you know, the bridge and the queen and all that kind of stuff, because you would think they were going to eat you. This is Ansar, Lord of the Underworld, Lord of the Perfect Black. He is the Netaru of the Mushroom, of DMT. Because he's talking about, when they say underworld, it's not from a Christian sensibility. It's not where um, you're going to be burned up down in hell or something like that. But it is the subatomic world is so small that there's no light there because the photons of which light are produced are magnitudes above the underworld of which the triple thick darkness dwells. A darkness so black, not that there's any light there, but no light exists. This is the Edfu Temple. It is what contains the records of the singing of Atlantis. This is the place where they hold the records of the seven sacred mounds of which the great temples were built and of which the seven sages disseminated knowledge from the stars out into the world. This is a hieroglyphic picture. No, it's not a hieroglyphic picture, but of course it is. This is a technology that paired with hallucinogenic mushrooms at high dose, at certain doses, well, these are the mushroom caps here. This is the ceremony of the opening of the mouth to give him animation in the underworld of which Ansar is the lord of the perfect black. So they're going to take the mushrooms on the, on the table of the food of the gods and put it into the mouth. Now you see a noop, which is the jackal. The jackal is holding the mushroom glyph, the glyph of the mystery, the shadow. 
So you can see he has his hand on the shaft of the mushroom cap. Because this is superimposed in front of the mummy. It's not part of the mummy. Because this is how you decode this information. Because at certain doses, the glyphs become animate. You've seen, you've been in the bathroom throwing up from mushrooms or something like that. <laughs> and the characters on your shower curtain are undulating. Does the same thing here, but this has a structure to it because it's paired to mushrooms. At higher doses, these characters come off the page into your environment. They come off the page into your bedroom. <laughs> then at the highest doses, you go into the page. And this is where the teaching goes on. That's how they brought back all this stuff, all this information. It's a technology. And it was in different parts of the world. This, oh, excuse me. This is Ansar in his mushroom form. So what I did was I put a mushroom next to it. Disregard the crook and the frail, flail. Disregard where they knocked his head out. This is the mushroom glyph here. This is the mushroom. This is how you decode. This is the secret of ancient Egypt. That it was a hallucinogenic culture. A hallucinogenic civilization. This is the apis bull. Because they learned how to cultivate fungi and mushrooms in ancient Kemet. It's been shown on the walls in different temples. The Egyptian Mycological Society, of which is, you know, going on today, they have verified psilocybin mushrooms in ancient Egypt on the walls and in the pillars. This is the dung of which comes from this cow that was utilized for the mushroom patties to grow the mushrooms for the high priests. Only the high priest and the highest got mushrooms from this because it was, they were grazed in the canary grass. Canary grass is a DMT-containing DMT grass. It has 5-MeO DMT in it. It has its own monoamine oxidase inhibitor in it. And it was ingested by the cow. The cow gives the patties, and they utilize these in baskets to grow the mushrooms for the priesthood. This is the canary grass. These are mushrooms growing on the cow pies. Now these aren't the ones that were pre-Kemetic or pre-Egypt when the Sahara was still wet with tributaries and rivers and streams. That one was called Tamari or Tamari. This is the dung beetle, the sacred beetle of ancient Egypt. Why is it the sacred beetle of ancient Egypt? Because it rolled dung across the desert? No. Because the baby beetles would be deposited in the hole that the, that the beetle dug. And when they put the dung in the hole with the baby beetles, when the baby beetles sprouted out, mushrooms would sprout out of the dung and the baby beetles would eat the mushrooms. Why is the cow revered? Why is the cow sacred? Is it because of milk, butter, ghee, meat? Not in India though, but why is it revered? Because it gives knowledge. The great cow. From its patties, from its excretement. Now these mushrooms will grow on camel dung, elephant dung, but they are particularly in the liking of cow dung. So the beetle would roll the dung ball across. This beetle was probably um, taking some ketamine or something because his ball isn't all the way around. <laughs> but he would bury that and the baby beetles would eat the mushrooms that came out of the dung ball. And this is a depiction to show the reverence of the dung beetle pushing the knowledge of this solar system across the horizon. 
This is the scarification that they use in Africa. You're not so much familiar with this one, but the black, what they call medicine, is put in these cuts to help with the keloid. The black medicine that they brought from Sirius, from the Sirius star system when they came here. That's another lecture. But also here, the tattoo. This is a guild of vision. What they did was they would take their entheogen and look at the person and these lines would come out into the person's environment, the tattooer, and then he would trace each and every one. And you'd have to trace perfectly. You couldn't put anything on a person that wasn't there because this gave them a way to bring their power from the other realms into this realm and it was hallucinogenic. The same thing with Michelangelo and Neil Leonardo da Vinci and others. They were tripping. When he went to that quarry and said, looked at the side of it, he saw it. He said, that, cut that piece out right there. And then what he did was bring it back to his shop and he liberated David from that block of stone. The greatest artists, the greatest artists have a way to project vision into their canvas, and then they trace what they see. Me, I try to paint something or draw something, it's just crazy. But the entheogenic highway through the secret societies and guilds of this earth, they're all based upon entheogens. They're all based upon eating mushrooms and the Torah and all of the different things. The Torah is a tricky one. It has to like you. If it doesn't like you, it'll kill you. Morning glory seeds. You know, you got to know what you're doing with these things. The reason why mushrooms are so available and were available first is because mushrooms have a very high LD50. You can't eat enough to kill yourself. You can't try that with the other things because the high dose, and I'm talking 25 grams, 30 grams, Talking about 40 grams, I'm talking about 50 grams. And I have people calling me on Facebook or, or you know, messaging me on Facebook all the time because I'm supposed to be the high dose guy. Hey, Kalindi, I, I took 60 dry grams of psilocybin last night. You know, I'm like, well, why are you talking to me? Why aren't you asleep? You know, <laughs> he said, what do you think about 60 grams? I said, I don't know. I've never taken 60 grams of dried <laughs> mushrooms, I've taken 50. And the most difficult trip that I've ever had in my life was I broke a 40-day water and urine fast the day of my wife's, the, the day I broke that fast on 40 grams of psilocybin mushrooms because my wife passed. And I went in to bring her back. And the things that I went through on that trip that's what they say, set and setting, your mindset got to be right. You know, my wife had just died, and my mindset wasn't right. So inside of that trip, it was my most challenging trip that I've ever had. But this thing is not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be easy on you who's taking it. It's not supposed to be easy on society. It's dis disruptive. It's a disruptive technology. And it is difficult. Many times it can be dark. Many times it can be malevolent. Many times you can meet exotic and novel creatures that have absolutely nothing to do with whatever you've ever seen. And you have to, in that encounter, stand. When you go places, you can't go in as a peasant. You can't go in, oh, you etheric beings, let me bow to your magnificence and all that kind of stuff. No, you gotta walk up in there like you own the place, you know? <laughs> The entity is 80 feet tall, and you're about this small, and you're walking past, you know, hey, what's happening? <laughs> Keep right on walking. That's the only way you can make it through this thing. Yes, it can be scary. It's not all bubbles and sunshine and, you know, I talk to people, yeah, we were smoking DMT, looking at beavers and butthead on the TV. I'm like, how you smoking DMT? And there's still a TV in your house for you to watch Beavis and Butthead. 
You're not supposed to be in the same. You're not supposed to be in the same place if you're smoking enough to break through. And psilocybin being that it has a very high LD50. That one of the things you can take off of your plate, off your plate is, okay, am I gonna kill myself? Now you may think you're gonna die. You may die, but you know, in the morning you're gonna get up and have some coffee, and Monday morning you gotta go to work and you know get the children off and things like that. <laughs> kind of like in Doctor Strange with Domamu. You know, we're gonna have to make a deal here. Shoop. Then he walks back again. We're gonna have to make a deal here. We're gonna have to make a deal here. Fire comes up and burns him up. The only the thing that I found about the multiverse through hallucinogens, through psychedelics, through entheogens, is that the only thing that is impossible in all that exists, in every space and time, dimension, whatever, is that you can't die. You can be stuck in some pretty horrible places, and anybody that's been in one of those loops of millions and millions of years, <laughs> where you're stuck in there, And I give credence to everybody who takes psychedelics, no matter what dose you take. I'm never one that says, oh, you're only taking three grams. That's not nothing. No, it takes courage to do that. But we have to push the envelope. We're at a very critical time in our existence. I don't look at psilocybin as a medicine. Ayahuasca may be a medicine. MDMA may be a medicine. They may be medicines, but mushrooms are not medicine. They are tools for the exploration of consciousness into the multiverse, to become more than what we are, to take the next phase of what we are becoming, because it pushed us out of the proto-human into the human, and it's only been, if you gauge it with the time from when that happened to now, it's less than what you would think a second would be. We're moving up and out of this thing so quickly. And everything is moving exponentially. Technology is developed in warehouses and different places around the world that are happening moment by moment. Knowledge is moving exponentially so that you can't keep up. They're doing cyborgs. Exotic in Entities, therianthropes, they're, they're using the CRISPR to connect wolf genes to soldiers. They're manipulating myostatin. That if you give if you give this myostatin inhibitor to a 13 year old, you can make an eight foot tall, 750 pound kid by 18 by manipulating the DNA. You can build a child with one orange eye and one purple eye with green hair. This is happening right now. The technology is here right now. So you either have the organic singularity or the technological singularity, singularity via Ray Kurzweil and the rest of those guys. Google has produced a 56 quibit quantum computer, and it can do calculations in three seconds, which would take the combined computer power of all the supercomputers on Earth a trillion years to crack. So what is the psychedelic community which has access to the transdimensional, hyperdimensional, extradimensional realms and the information in those realms, what are you going to do? I think that MAPS has a noble purpose through legislation and uh, dealing with people's PST, you know, post-traumatic stress disease and, you know, uh, people at parties, because I, I was just in Budapest at Ozara. It's not, you know, it's not 
Burning Man, but there's 50,000 people there. Doom, 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 doom. Somebody hand them something, they take it. Doom, 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 doom. Somebody, here, take this. Doom, 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 doom. So, yes, we need harm control. <laughs> you know, because, you know, you got young, young people, you know what I mean, 18, going to their first festival, the music is 24 hours, a whole week of the same, you know, I'm like an old Temptations guy and stuff like that, but a whole week of the same beat, dump, 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 you know, and I'm in my tent, I got on ear, earphones and earplugs and everything else because I'm speaking at the psychedelic portion of the festival, you know, and they're sitting in <laughs> dropping acid in the lecture and stuff like that, you know, but this is Budapest, you know, Eastern Europe, so, you know, it's kind of a little different sensibility, but um, this is what's going on, so we need those things, yes. I'm not a permission person, you know, that's why I like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the psychedelic transdimensional currency. That's why Silk Road, when you wanted to buy your LSD, you wanted to buy other stuff, you use Bitcoin. But Bitcoin is on the blockchain. So is psilocybin, it's on the blockchain. The records are in the blockchain. That's what mycelium is. That's why the most popular cryptocurrency wallet is called a mycelium wallet. Your DNA is on the blockchain. It's permissionless. Just like psychedelics to me, I don't need permission to grow, excuse me, I don't grow mushrooms, I cultivate mushrooms. I don't need permission from the city fathers and mothers, I don't need permission from the government because it's a sovereign right to be able to utilize what you want to utilize when you want to utilize it. If you do no harm to anyone else, And that's really what it's about, cognitive liberty. So this is a spore print. Sister who talked about the Iboga. And she's absolutely right, Basi, that it is, in it is endangered. And Iboga is an ordeal when you do it for real. I mean, not, you know, we are, you know, tourist Iboga, stuff like that. They'll give you the tourist Iboga just like they give you the tourist Ayahuasca. They get you to the gate of death with Iboga. The old elders sit there and they, okay, they can take one more. <laughs> give them one more. Because if you take one more past that one more, you're going to be existing in that same realm Forever, because you're not coming back here. <laughs> so mushrooms from spores, there are millions of spores on this print. You learn to cultivate. You have your entheogen there with you so that you can go when you need to go. Some people go once a month. Some people go on the new moon. Some go on the full moon. Some specialize when they come up with those uh, new super moons and all that kind of stuff, the big red moon or whatever it is, they go then. Or they go the, the solstices and the equinoxes. The women go sometimes, they go on their uh, monthly cycle. But with one spore print, you can produce mushrooms the rest of your life if you're diligent. It's nothing, you, you don't have to worry about over harvesting or anything like that. But the circle within the circle. This is an underside of a mushroom cap, the circle within the circle. And this is a subatomic particle at CERN, the circle within the circle with the lines radiating out. Because these things come into the public domain of this dimension through succeedingly successful energies that produce what we have here. This is the acacia, nilotica, the acacia of the Nile, the tree of life. This is the nisut biti, 
because Pharaoh is not the name of it, of the, the, the head of the Egyptian society. It's the Nisut Biti. And what he's doing is he's suckling from the milk of the acacia. The Maasai, who were in the 19th century the most fierce ethnic group in East Africa. And what they do is they have different levels of acacia brews. They have one bag that they drink out of that you go and fight a lion. Just the, the, the one person goes and fights a lion, you gotta come back with the lion skin. Then they have another bag you drink that is for group combat. Then you have another bag that is for single combat. Then you have another bag where you run 50 miles from the pharmacology of these acacias. So it's not just in ancient Egypt, it's in modern Africa also. They pair it with what is called African rue. You call it Syrian rue. These are the seeds, of course. This is the, the carpet, the magic carpet of Aladdin. This is a place, this is a technology. The ancients utilized mushrooms and other compounds with technology. This is a mnemonic informational structure. Each, you see the little footballs going around? Those are all different universes. You have in each swirl a different place and a way to get there. You have on one side the paternal line. You don't have on the other side the maternal line. The old women get the young girl, sit her on the carpet, give her her entheogens, they take the entheogens too, and they take that swirl to where the babies are. And they get the baby and they take that swirl back so that the codes for that child are embedded in the egg, which is a clear matrix. That's why they had parthenogenesis for 80,000 years. Because you can put the information in the matrix and the matrix will fulfill that, but there were only females produced from that. So on the other side, you have, well, that's the maternal line. The paternal line, you take the codes and put it in the sperm. And when these two children are married, that's where they arranged marriages. They didn't let you get 20 and walk around and find somebody in the street because they had on some nice jeans and a nice shirt and y'all get married and bring a baby here from no wherever. They went and got the child. They put the boy and together, the boy and the girl together who was supposed to be together to bring that child. This is a technology. This is a place. Puzzles. Labyrinths. This is a, man, a mandala, Tibet. Sand painting. We look at them, they're beautiful. Two-dimensional. But this is a place. This is where they go to study on entheogens. Forget what they're telling you now about Buddhism, that they don't use psychedelics. They may not use them now, but they did. Because once you take the, 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 the mushroom sitting in front of this, this is what it becomes. It unfolds into three dimensionality. Then it goes into four dimensions, five dimensions. And regardless of what the string theorists say, 11 dimensions, there are Google Plexians of dimensions. This is what happens. It comes up out of itself into this and then you shrink down and go into this. And that's where the sages and spiritual people are on the hyperdimensional realm to teach the knowledge. Tapestries. I was in the Vatican last year. And the tapestries going down the wall to the Sistine Chapel ceiling, the tapestries are on the wall watching you walk down the hallway Before you get to the Sistine Chapel ceiling, then when you get in the Sistine Chapel ceiling, you can't take no pictures of it. They'll 
throw you off the top of the roof because you have to buy the book at the end of the tour because the Japanese own the copyright to the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Mushrooms on the statues. Does anybody know what that is? Nobody ever seen Hellraiser? Cinnabite puzzle box? Now people will tell you, oh, that's just a movie they made up. When they asked Geiger, who put together the artwork for aliens, and they said, how do you think these things up? And Geiger said, I don't think any th these things up. These things are real. This is what I saw. So I'm just painting what I saw. So I can tell you, I can give you 30 grams of mushrooms. We can do it together. We can go to the toy store and buy one of these puzzle boxes. If you're willing to take 30 grams, I'm willing to take 30 grams, and we can sit in front of this puzzle box. And it will do the exact thing it did in the movie, and Pinhead and them live in there. Arjuna and Krishna. Not the yoga that we have now, because that's just basically 19th century European gymnastics. And the new are yogas, and I'm not getting, the, getting, the, uh, getting on the yoga people because yoga is great. You should do it. It's a good stretch. It gives you discipline, all those different things. But the sovereign yoga of Krishna and the knowledge in the Bhagavad Gita inside of the Mahabharata, which he gave to Arjuna, was through Soma. Yoga without Soma is not the yoga. And I know now they got hot yoga, cold yoga, you know, all different types of yogas. But this is the yoga. It is the yoking together of you with the higher self so that it can move through the dimensionality of the different worlds and galaxies that they have. Five minutes? Okay, move quick. <laughs> These are talking about the transdimensional conch shells. This is the Bhagavad Gita. This is the chakra. Uh, Arjuna's uh, universal form he saw in Krishna with forms of the lords with many mouths and eyes and visions and numerous divine ornaments. This is what he saw when he gave it to him. So if you're not seeing this kind of stuff, you know, you're diminishing part of your experience. I'm going to move through this quickly. Uh, I want to get to, that's the first, uh, Professor Gates. Um, these are the Adinkra, of which are fractal subatomic aggregates of particles that do not exist unless you <laughs> observe them. This is a, a long lecture. And these are the codes, the block linear self-dual self uh, error correcting codes that Google and Facebook uses. I want to move to this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this because it's a couple of minutes, but this is, this is all part of it. The sorcerers, the magic people, this is what we have. We have a, a grand mystery that many can traverse Right now, you don't have to think about 10,000 years ago there were people that flew and all this kind of stuff. You fly on a long Saturday night with a handful of mushrooms. Adventure's not over. It is still within reach. It takes courage. It takes discipline. Because most, a lot of people take high dose and they blank out. But it's an art form. You can't just do it once and say, oh, I didn't remember nothing, and then go back to three grams. No, you have to do it over and over and over. It's class. You didn't go to kindergarten and say, oh, well, I didn't like the teacher and the blocks, and then leave. So this is it. I see through you. Knocked this astral form out of his physical body because he was a doctor, and he didn't believe in that nonsense that there is something more than the physical. And if we do at our tripping, what did you just do to me? we are only hallucinating in our mind. What's in that tea? Psilocybin? LSD? What, what did he say? Just what was in that tea? Psilocybin? LSD? What just happened? For a moment, 
You entered the astral dimension. What? A place where the soul exists apart from the body. Why are you doing this to me? To show you and they just do their how research. much you don't know. They're not just making this stuff Open up. Your eyes. Frank, Frank Bruner. Excuse me. Frank Bruner and his partner would make their Marvel deadlines by dropping acid and eating mushrooms in the East Village in New, in New York. And that's how they came up with this Doctor Strange Masters of the, of the uh, Mystic Arts. So if you ain't traveling on your way to your trip, because this ain't it, this is on the way. He looks all right to me. Looks all right to me. The world works. You think that this material universe is all there is? What is real? What mysteries lie beyond the reach of your senses? At the root of existence, mind and matter meet. Thoughts shape reality. Thoughts shape your reality. A lot of you get in some bad spots because that mindset again. I'm going to die. Oh, these hands are getting me. He's only one of an infinite number. Now listen. Worlds without end. Some benevolent and life-giving. Beautiful. Others filled with malice and hunger. Dark places where powers older than time. Where dark worlds where powers older than time exist. There are those spots. If you're going to take high doses, you're going to hit them also. But you have to stand. This is um, one group that we went to uh, Mexico to in the Aztec ruins, smoke the five MEO toad, and then we descend the mountain. And in the evening, we take the Zapatocorum mushrooms, which are the mushrooms that grow where the lightning strikes. We do this once a year. Also, we have the Detroit Psychedelic Conference coming up in August of 2020. Um, it is a grassroots, urban, really doing it, psychedelic conference. People are doing it because we have midwives there who do psychedelic midwifery, doula. You know, in 2017, in Cleveland, they had the Women in Intelligence Conference where the theme was psilocybin during pregnancy, delivery, and breastfeeding after, of which you have women who throughout the whole pregnancy are taking psilocybin to produce super babies. Um, so we have some things up next year. Hopefully you can make it. There'll be information coming out. Um, uh, move through this presentation quickly. Uh, it's a lot more, but thank you very much for listening and have a good evening. Thank you for inviting me.